So you bought or built yourself an AR style rifle for home defense and while you made a fantastic decision and I will congratulate you, uh, you did a bunch of research, some reading and some video watching and stuff like that, but you just simply have not logged a whole lot of experience on the weapon system yet. Well, in today's video, what I'm gonna do is impart on you some tribal knowledge. And I'm gonna start off by saying that uh, everything that we're gonna talk about in today's video, you can figure out for yourself the hard way. If you just sat down and shot like 100,000 rounds through your rifle, you'd know all the things that we're gonna talk about in today's video. But if you stick tuned, then I'll give you a little bit of a fast track to speed you forward a couple years on that so you don't have to put in as much work. Now, today's video is going to be a little bit more geared to our new users, but if you're an experienced user of the AR, then you can probably get something out of this video too, and two things come to my mind. First, you can use this video to send to somebody who you're trying to bring up to speed quickly, and secondly, I'm gonna have some stuff in here that uh, you may not know. So thank you guys very much for tuning in. And real quick, we're gonna go ahead and take our capitalism break so we can get right to the AR-15. Today's video is brought to you by Ace Tack Gear. Ace Tack does all the nylon things. So if you're looking to get into a plate carrier or chest rig, or you're just trying to augment the gear that you already have with some expansion pouches, here are your guys. Recently, I did a video on their medical kit, which is a collaboration with Everlit Survival. I'll have that video as well as the minimalist chest rig video I recently did from Ace Tech listed below for you to run down. What's more is both those companies offer VSO viewers a discount. So if you use my code listed over at the affiliates page, you can save 10%. Special thanks to them for making this video possible. So why on earth should you listen to me? Well, my name is Curtis Hallstrom. I run the VSO gun channel, which you're currently watching and I've been using the AR-15 since shortly after my 18th birthday when I built my first rifle. I'm currently 36 years old as of the filming of this video. I've been using it all along that time and I've been running the VSO gun channel for a little over a decade at this point in time. Through those experiences I've accumulated, this room holds a little over 50 uh, AR-15s of different types and calibers, etc., etc that I've accumulated over the years, as well as a whole bunch of other types of guns. My main profession these days is testing and evaluating different firearms and accessories from manufacturers as they come out to the market. I also produce my own small batch of ARs for sale to the public periodically, and I cannot tell you how many rounds I have fired through AR-15s over the years, but it's gotta be approaching a million. And those aren't just range time rounds. These are also rounds through training courses from a variety of different schools around the country. Now, it is gonna be almost impossible for me to do a video like this one and not have at least some of my bias and opinion bleed through into the things that I'm telling you. In fact, I would say that you probably want at least some of the things that I have opinions about, maybe not all of them. In post-production, somewhere up here on screen, I have a designator of whether I'm speaking from the perspective of my opinion or whether it is a verifiable fact that you can go out there and find on the internet yourself from some kind of third party to verify the information. The first thing we're gonna talk about is the magazine of the AR-15. Contrary to some of the bluster that might be going around out there, this is a standard capacity magazine. This is what they look like, and standard capacity magazines for ARs in this day and age, as in going off of what is issued and what is often shipped with various firearms across the industry, this is the standard capacity magazine. These are made in a whole bunch of different types, shapes and sizes that we will talk about here shortly, but this is a standard capacity magazine. And standard capacity magazines for AR-15s chambered in 5.56 are capable of holding 30 rounds of ammunition. However, it is my opinion that that is not the correct loading for that magazine. It is either 29 or 28. Now, the reason that is, is that this magazine is currently loaded to 28 rounds of ammunition. And you can see that if I push down on that top round, there's a fair amount of play in that ammunition in the stack. And what that allows us to do, if we were to insert this magazine on a closed bolt AR-15, as in uh, we fired it or we're loading it new, or for whatever reason, the bolt did not lock back or is not locked back. If I take this magazine and insert it into this gun, it locks up, right? It's not going anywhere. By contrast, if I were to take this same magazine and take two rounds of ammunition to top it off to bring its, uh, its capacity to 30, you can see that if I push on that top round, there's almost no play there. 
If I go to insert this magazine into this gun, it has a hard time overcoming the latch because there is no play in that stack and it is bottoming out on the closed bolt. If I were to simply lock the bolt to the rear, then you will see that this magazine locks right up, right? So the concept is that you slightly download the magazine for the purposes of making sure that it will always lock up easily into your firearm. Because sometimes they will get stuck and they seem like they're in and then you go to work the bolt and the magazine falls out and you've left it in the dust behind you, you know, five or six paces. It's not a good situation, particularly when we're talking about a weapon that we're trying to use for home defense. There are two types of magazines that I prefer to use. Uh, the first is the metal type magazine that you guys have seen on the video already. Uh, either the aluminum or the steel variant, that one's a personal preference on, on you guys. I prefer the aluminum ones uh, because they're a little bit lighter than the steel ones, but you know, six of one, half dozen of another. And then my pick for like the polymer magazine is the Mission First Tactical Extreme Duty magazine. And this is one that has a little bit of extra space built into the bottom of it so that you can get that full complement of ammunition. These are also very good, my phone not yours, my phone not yours. Uh, for making the switch to 300 blackout uh, because they have some considerations in there for the larger projectile size. Uh, the magazine that I do not really care for that ships with a lot of firearms in the United States is the PMAC, and I have been vocal about this over the years. If you would like to run down my commentary and testing on PMAGs uh, throughout the years and it's available on the channel, you can go run that down at your leisure, have a good time. However, whether it is a good magazine or not, or whether you believe that it is a good magazine or not, is entirely irrelevant to why it ends up in many an AR box across the country. In fact, I would say that the PMAG has almost become like the default position when it comes to including a magazine with the rifle. The reason that it obtained that status is quite simply because it is the lowest bidder. Magpul provides OEM pricing to uh, manufacturers of rifles at a rate that other manufacturers in the space just simply cannot compete with. And if you think about it, and this is my opinion, it's brilliant because they can basically give PMAGs away at cost to the rifle manufacturers and particularly new people are going to stick with what they know. So if your rifle ships with a PMAG, they know that if they gave those, those magazines away to the manufacturer, essentially, that you're good for three to five more of those things at full retail price. And then you have the other argument about people who want everything to be the same, you know, uniformity and all that sort of stuff. It's a, again, brilliant marketing strategy. Fitment. There is a lot to do about this. The fitment between the upper and the lower. You'll see things written like, oh, you know, the gun's more accurate if it's if it's got a solid lockup. That is completely bogus. Critical components for accuracy are contained in the upper receiver. There is no interaction with the lower receiver as it relates to accuracy of your firearm. The only purpose of the lower receiver is to contain the fire control components and bring them into the correct orientation to initiate the rest of the process that the upper does, okay? This right here, that little rattle, the tolerance between the upper and the lower has nothing to do with that. In fact, it is a feature, not a flaw. You want a rifle that has some tolerance built in either between the upper and the lower or between the magazine and the mag well. And oftentimes you will see the balance struck where both of them have some wiggle. So right here, we have some wiggle in the upper and lower that you can hear. And then if I take a magazine, there's a little bit of wiggle there. If you watch this gun fire in slow motion, you will see that magazine rock back and forth ever so slightly as the Magazine changes orientation slightly as the bolt passes over it and strips that cartridge off. This is much more prolific if we use a magazine that doesn't have to be made out of uh, thicker materials to sustain it. All polymer magazines are going to be thicker in their material construction. Uh, if I put this magazine in here, 
much more visible that uh, that has some play in it. Again, this is vital, not for accuracy, for functionality. If the gun is super tight here and super tight here, it's gonna be less reliable. You can push it in either direction. You can either have it super hogged out between the upper and the lower and have it tight to the magwell, or you can have it super loose to the magwell and tight in the upper and lower. Again, most guns try to strike that balance so that there's a little bit of play in both places. The eternal debate. Should you use the ping pong paddle or the charging handle when you perform your reloads? Well, I have very strong opinions about this from a training standpoint, but I will meter them down ever so slightly for the purposes of today's video. If you are a 100% ping pong paddle runner, as in you put the magazine in, you push the ping pong paddle, uh, you've already verified that you know, through the previous firing sequence, you could feel the bolt lock back. Cool, got you. Push the button, go back to work. Shave a second off, right? When we're talking about a home defense scenario, there are many a thing that can render your firearm less than 100% efficient. As in, it may be very likely that that bolt does not make it all the way to the rear. Remember the root word of gunfight is fight, not gun. What I would say to you is if you are a go-to ping pong paddle person, then you should at least consider periodically doing some drills where you only run the charging handle and you skip that step. Try to create that neuro pathway where you skip this step because I've seen it hundreds of times at this point in time in training classes where somebody goes to push the ping pong paddle and nothing happens. And they push the ping pong paddle again, nothing happens, and they push it a third time and nothing happens. And then they stand there and stare at it for half a second and then they realize that there's a thing that they can work back here that'll put a cartridge in the, in the breech. You will notice that when I hit this, bolt goes forward and if I hit it again, nothing happens. Nothing happens, nothing happens. However, the bolt being forward is does not get in the way whatsoever if I go like this, right? So you could say that the ping pong paddle works the majority of the time. The charging handle works all of the time, except for in the small instances where there's a major malfunction and in which case neither of the two will work. Spend some of your time doing it the slow method, getting used to running the charging handle in a pinch. Which brings me up to what distance should we zero the optic, laser, or iron sights, right? Uh, the answer is 50 yards, and all the other answers are wrong and should not be used. And obviously there will be an opinion banner up here, but I'm gonna walk you through the logic on why it is that I use the 50 yard zero and why I am advocating that you use the 50 yard zero for a home defense gun. To do that, we have to take several steps back and I apologize, this might get a little bit technical, but I'll do my best to keep it as simple as possible. Remember back to high school physics, I know that was a long time ago for some of you and the ones that did it recently probably weren't paying attention either. So uh, when you fire a projectile parallel to the ground, the bullet goes out and then gravity takes over and the bullet goes like that, right? So if I were to fire a projectile parallel to the ground out of this rifle and it comes out down here, there is no way that it can rise to the height of the sights, right? Because the sights are up here, it can't get there. Except for we accomplish that by creating a little bit of an angle upward in the barrel. We do that by adjusting the sight so that the line of sight actually points downward, making us raise the angle of the barrel ever so slightly. The angle is approximately 0 0.08 degrees to affect a 50 yard impact. Now what happens when we do that is the bullet is going to travel from down here to up here, a distance of roughly two and a half inches over the course of 50 yards. It's going to strike that target in the center at 50 yards and it's gonna keep on going up until gravity takes over. Now, the distance that bullet travels before gravity starts bringing it back down to the zero and below is very heavily dependent on its velocity. How much distance can it cover before gravity, a unit of gravity, if you wanna think about it like that, pulls it back down to Earth. Now, the 5.56 projectile is doing somewhere around 2,600 feet per second to 3,200 feet per second. And depending on the velocity, it's a relatively fast bullet, right? So it's gonna cover a decent amount of distance. However, if you use a 50 yard zero, then what you end up with is about four inches of rise over the zero 
at 100 yards. The maximum ordinate is somewhere around 100, 110 yards, right? We want to be roughly half the maximum ordinate because that decreases the amount of deviation across the whole spectrum that we're going to use it. So home defense gun, I'm thinking inside of 300 yards. You can still make 400 yard hits with a 500 or with a 50 yard zero. However, there's a little bit of uh, work that's involved. But basically, for a 50 yard zero, you are good out to 300 yards, point of aim, point of impact. The reason we do not use the 25, 33, or 100 yard zeros is because they do not minimize that deviation across the range. Let's take, for instance, 25 and 33, the close ones. If you move the target closer and zero at those distances, then in order to clear that two and a half inches, you have to put a more extreme angle on the barrel, which means that the bullet is going to be traveling along a steeper arc, which means that the maximum ordinate is going to be higher than if we use the 50 yard zero. Conversely, if we talk about the 100 yard zero, well now we're pretty much right at the maximum ordinate, so that means that everything else is going to be wrong low. Inside 100 yards, outside of 100 yards, then everything's gonna be low. That means that you're almost always off if the target isn't exactly at 100 yards, right? So that's why we don't use the 100 yard zero either. That's why all of those are wrong and you should use the 50 yard zero. Which brings me up to height over bore deviation. Let's use the 50 yard zero for the sake of discussion. Remember that if I zero at 50 yards, then that bullet has to move from here to here. If I shoot at a target that's inside that distance, it hasn't quite made it there. Let's choose 30 yards for the sake of discussion. If the target's at 30 yards, then the bullet has risen roughly three fifths of the distance from here to here. So that bullet's gonna hit low. So if you're firing this weapon inside of a confined space like your house, I don't know about you, uh, but none of the houses that I've been in recently have 50 yard hallways. Maybe yours does. The longest shot in my house is roughly 30 feet. So I have to know that at 30 feet, basically there is no deviation from if the muzzle was pressed up against the target. It doesn't matter whether you use the 50 yard zero, the 25 yard zero, the 100 yard zero, it, it, none of those matter for that kind of distance because we're so close. So you can just assume that you can have roughly two, two and a half inches between where you aimed negative for your bullet impact. So you're gonna hit low if you're firing in a confined space like your house. All right, folks, well, I covered about half the topics that I wanted to cover today, and I'm at twice the time that I normally do for videos. So if this video ends up popular, if you like it, then I'll go ahead and make a part two and cover the rest of the stuff. Thanks for watching the VSO Gun Channel. Hopefully we're gonna see you on another video here pretty soon.